On this episode of In Your Neighborhood, we're taking a trip back in time. where today they mill flour the exact same way they did in the 1700s. What is now known as H&C Groves Mill has a rich history dating back to 1783 when John Bayer built this mill. From Bayer, the mill was sold to William Chamberlain. From the Chamberlain family, it was sold to John von Alza and he had it for a short period of time from like 1853 to 1860 and then he sold it to um, Cyrus Hoffa and he had it from 1860 to 1910 and then it came into my family via Charlie's, uh, Charles Whitmer. Whitmer and his wife were the adoptive parents of Falk's great-grandmother. When Charlie Whitmer died in 1945, my great-grandfather, Harry Grove, bought it off the Whitmer estate, off of Kate Whitmer, his widow. Harry Grove operated the mill with his son, Charles, hence the H and C in the mill's name. Charles Grove taught his grandson, Curtis Falk, everything there is to know about running the mill. Today, Falk, assisted by his father and a few employees, keeps the mill running. While many other water-powered mills have been turned into museums or have ceased operation, Grove's Mill is perhaps the only mill of its kind in continuous operation since it was opened. Falk began our tour with an explanation of how the mill operates. We run off of two vertical turbines. Uh, they were made in Christiana, Pennsylvania. They call them CMC turbines, Christiana Machine Company. And one develops approximately 27 horsepower, and the other one develops approximately 23 horsepower. The turbines were installed at the mill in 1910 and 1923, respectively. I had envisioned the classic water wheel mounted on the outside of the mill. That is not at all the setup at Grove's Flour Mill. If you picture an upside down bowl, okay. okay, it's sitting in about eight and a half to nine feet of water in what they call a penstock. Okay? Okay. And there's shutters, vision shutters on the outside of this bowl. Okay, You open up a gate, you turn a wheel upstairs and that opens up the shutters. Okay, which allows the water to come into the bowl, so to speak. And inside that bowl, there's fins in there and the water spins those fins around. In order to get water to the mill, a dam was built on Buffalo Creek. In 1938, Charles Whitmer built the concrete dam that still serves the mill today. We have a dam that's 182 feet wide. Our raceway is approximately three quarters of a mile long the head race and then uh, it brings the water into the mill and then the tail race which is where the water comes out the front of the building and continues back to the creek is probably somewhere around a half a mile long. One of the keys to the longevity of the turbines is keeping them free of debris. We have out back of the mill what uh, before the water comes into the mill they're what they call trash racks. And what they are is they're boards that are an inch wide and they're spaced about an inch apart. And we have a rake that's made up that we can rake all the trash that comes in up against those racks. And the reason they're there for is so that nothing, no large objects can get into the penstock where the turbines are and damage those. There are times when raking the trash racks is a full-time job. In the fall of the year when the leaves are coming off the trees and all the leaves are coming down the creek, we rake so many leaves. I mean, wow. there can be a guy that stands out there in the worst days, somebody ought to stand out there all day long and just rake the leaves out of the, out of the creek. Inside the mill, the elevators, flower packer, mixer, grain cleaner, and the individual mills are all powered by the turbines. Much of the equipment is locally made. Almost all the uh, equipment that's in this mill was made in Muncie, Pennsylvania, either by Sprout Waldron or Robinson Manufacturing Company. 
You would expect a place with such a long history to be steeped in tradition, so it isn't surprising to find that the only source of heat is a pot-bellied stove and the cash register is from the early 1900s. The one thing that has changed over the years is the way the mill does business. Originally when the mill was built, people would just bring in, the local farmers would bring in their grain, and if they had extra, they would sell the extra to the mill, and then he would process it and take the stores in town, the miller would, and other people would put on grain bank, what they called it, they would store the wheat here, and lots of times how it worked was if you brought in a bushel of wheat, they would mill it for you and you would get back a 25 pound bag of flour. But the miller kept the bran and the middlings, the byproduct of the wheat process. And the other thing that they would do is they would bring in their, their corn and their oats and they would turn that into cow feed or pig feed or chicken feed for the the farmer. What we're doing today is we make pastry flour and a lot of our pastry flour goes to the Amish and the Mennonite community. The mill also produces a wide range of animal feed. Pretty much all, all the people we sell to are, are grass-based operations, mm -hmm. uh, range-fed hens and hogs and, and grass-fed beef. Mm -hmm. And it's actually fit in quite nice because in today's world, we, we offer them products that are a little bit different. We use different minerals uh, than the average mill would use. Mm -hmm. uh, we get our minerals from Fertrell down in Bainbridge, which our minerals are certified organic. Oh, okay. And a lot of people like that, especially the people that just have a few, you know, pigs or, you know, 50 or 100 chickens or something like that, and they consume what they raise. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're more, you know, conscientious of what they're eating. All the basic ingredients Falk needs, like wheat and corn, are purchased from local growers. The building, which has never been restored, stands just as it did in 1783, and it has plenty of storage. All the, all the wheat that we buy, we store in the building. Oh, okay. Okay. We have storage for over 10,000 bushel. Wow. Okay, now... Wheat, we will run through four to 5,000 bushel approximately in a year from one harvest to the next harvest. And we designate that much storage for that. And then the rest of the storage is for corn, mm -hmm. oats, and soybeans. Now corn is something that's always readily available. Uh, wheat is something that is a little harder to come by throughout the year. So corn, we're bringing constantly, bringing in corn, we bring in corn, you know, on a weekly basis. The four flour mills are two-sided machines with rolls in each side. They grind and process the wheat into pastry flour. Like everything else, they were built to last. These machines have been in here all this time and these rolls have not been sharpened one time. The attrition mill is used for making feed. It works by grinding the materials between two discs that rotate in opposite directions. A stone burr mill is used solely for making cornmeal. A three-ton feed mixer is one of the newer additions. This was put in here in 1959. What they did was they actually tore the floor up oh, really? over here. They brought it up through underneath the archway mm -hmm. to get it in this mill. Wow. Okay. And then they put the floor back down again. Well, the, the whole structure outside is masonry except for one little spot back there that's wood. So that's basically the only, re the only way they could do it. We found Falk's father hard at work bagging goat feed during our visit. You've heard people say, if walls could talk. Well, at Grove's Mill, they do, in a manner of speaking. The warehouse wall is covered with the signatures of the many people who have been to the mill, including John Hoffa. Barrel head stamps, which were used to mark the barrels of flour, are also on the walls of the mill. This one from William Chamberlain's days, and another from Cyrus Hoffa. Now that Curtis had shown me all the machinery, it was time to demonstrate the turbines themselves. This is the wheel that actually opens the shutters on the side of the turbine. Oh heavens, okay. Okay. 
And this belt that you see coming up through here goes to this, it's called a tachometer, just like you have in a car today. Uh -huh. Now in your car, you're used to turning two, 3,000 RPMs. Yeah. This will turn like 184 RPMs. Max. Well, or, we or can kind go. kind of when you're running, that's where it is? Yeah, we like okay. to have it okay. about 184 RPMs. Okay. I mean, we can turn over 200, right. but it's not necessary. Got it. But I'll turn this, so this open. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so that opened the shutters. So when the shutters are closed, the water can just flow through and pass and it's not physically because there's nothing for it to push against. So it's it's just running around through there, correct? Well, it's just sitting there at a standstill. It's well, not even flowing through. Well, what about the stuff that's through. coming in? Well, the, it, the reason why you saw it coming in out there is because they're using the other turbine over there oh, to run the mixer. Okay, yeah. now if, you, if nothing is running in here, this is closed yep. and they're not running the mixer. Is the water just sitting back there? It's yep. not actually even physically flowing through the building. Right. Okay, I get it. What it's doing then is is it'll go over the overflows. Okay. That's that makes why sense. the overflows are there, yeah. No, I in case you're wondering why I was so startled, the floor beneath my feet started to vibrate as the turbine began to move. When you're standing in a 227-year-old building and the floor moves, well, you understand my surprise. On the lower level of the mill are all the gears and wheels that turn the equipment upstairs. Okay, this is a steel ring gear with wooden teeth set in it, okay? Okay. These are hard maple. We try to get them the wood from out around like Minnesota, the colder the climate the tighter the grain because right. the tree grew slower, all right? right? That is the shaft that turned, that opened up the shutters right Got there, okay? okay? Then this started going, going around this ring gear and then that turns this pinion gear here. It is the pinion gear that powers the equipment. The coupling you select determines which piece of machinery is running. A little further over, the other turbine was hard at work running the feed mixer. Falk gave us a demonstration of how they switch from one operation to another. Just take this, like this. Whoa! Okay, that takes one belt off. That's crazy! That took the mixer belt off. That puts a corn cutter on. The engineering that goes into running a mill on water power is fascinating. That Falk is still able to turn a profit using this technology in the modern era is inspiring. A feed and flour mill running on water power, right here in your neighborhood. Just ahead, we'll take you to 19th century Northumberland County, 